Hello and welcome to the latest edition of Doorstep History, which today comes from the newly reopened Hall of Memory in the centre of Birmingham. During the war of 1914-1918, around 150,000 men from Birmingham joined the forces to help Britain win the war. Sadly, 12,300 of them were killed in action, and a further 35,000 received life-changing injuries. After the war, towns and cities throughout the country built their own war memorials and cenotaphs to remember those people who had died. This is the memorial plaque at St George's Church in Edgbaston. Remember, Lord, those of our community of Edgbaston and Ladywood who gave their lives in the service of the nation and the cause of peace in the First World War. And this one is at St John's Church in Ladywood. A nearby an outdoor cross of sacrifice was erected at Warstone Lane Cemetery in the Jewellery Quarter. I think history is so important, to know where you come from, to know what happened before, to know what people sacrificed so that we could have the life we do today. Um, and that applies to everything you know that, that, that people in this country did for future generations. But it's so interesting, personally, for it to be a local thing, to know that there are so many people buried near where you live uh, who have a story to tell and perhaps no one knows it. The biggest memorial was built on Broad Street and is known as the Hall of Memory. At the end of the war, the area looked like this, a mass of old factories and canal side warehouses. All of these were cleared and the foundation stone for the hall was laid in 1923. Two years later, the building was opened to the public. Now the area around it was initially landscaped in a garden with colonnades. These colonnades, though, were removed to the nearby St Thomas's Church when the area was redesigned to make way for Centenary Square in 1990. Now, less than 30 years later, the square is being redesigned yet again, and this means the Hall of Memory has been closed to enable work to progress. In September this year, the hall was reopened in a ceremony attended by the Lord Mayor and Leader of the Council. In this place we remember with thanks here, before God's throne of grace, all those who have died on operational service from this city. We hold them in our hearts and give thanks for the example that they set to us, which continues on down through the generations. Three books of remembrance list the names of those Brummies who gave their lives in all wars. While the hall was closed, the books were kept in the Library of Birmingham, and now they have been returned to their rightful place, and once again the hall has become the centrepiece of Birmingham's act of remembrance. And one of the names in the book is John Aldridge. He was a teacher at St George's School in Ladywood and he lost his life exactly a century ago in September 1918. Let's have a look, see if we can find the name of Second Lieutenant Aldridge. So, he's in the... There's two Aldridges and here's J Aldridge, Second Lieutenant in the King's Rifle. That's our man. And there he is in the book in the Hall of Memory. If you know the name of a person who was killed in the war, you can research them on a website set up by the Commonwealth War Graves Commission. This organisation looks after the graves in cemeteries across the world. If you know when a person died, you may be able to find details or even a picture of him in newspapers, which can be accessed on a newspaper archive. And details of a person where they lived can be found on another website, which is from a census from 1911 that gives details about the person's family and address. And another record gives information from a diary kept by a soldier's regiment, which will tell you what was happening at the time he was killed. It's known that the 30-year-old lived here in Alfred Road in Spark Hill, in a house now demolished, and he is remembered on the war memorial at the nearby St John's Church. 
The 1911 census records that he had a sister Annie and his parents were known as Thomas and Myra. Using the research, I could then follow in his footsteps. Eldridge would have, no doubt, waved goodbye to the White Cliffs of Dover as he left for France by sea. Today, given the advances in technology over the last century, it's possible to travel by train under the channel, something that Eldridge would have thought impossible back in his day. Twenty-five members of the forces were killed in this field behind us. One of them was John Eldridge, the teacher from St George's School. The men formed up here at 4.30 in the morning. Communications were said to be difficult because of the mist lying in the valleys. The objective was to capture, first of all, a high trench across there in the valley of the River Omeon, leading across to the village capture the trench and then move on to the town or the village of Berthacore. The battalion records show that they fought their way right through to the village reaching the eastern outskirts and consolidated there throwing out sentry groups in front of the main line of resistance. The battalion headquarters took up a position in a half dug trench just short of the village from which there were extensive views of the countryside. It doesn't really look like a high ridge to me, but it's slightly higher than the land around it. And that was important to gain a position from where you could see the enemy. The British put down what was described as an excellent barrage of shrapnel and high explosives, which was put down in the area where the movement was seen. The result was that a counter-attack, which was expected, didn't really develop. The lieutenant colonel that was in charge was injured in the foot and needed to be evacuated. Besides the colonel, there were 24 other casualties. The ridge where Eldridge was killed is right behind us there, and the cemetery where he was buried is here, just yards away from where he was killed. So the grave here marked 2nd Lieutenant J.T. Eldridge, King's Royal Rifle Corps, 18th of September 1918, aged just 30. And the family have had inscribed onto the bottom of it, Greater love hath no man than this. As the centenary of the war approaches, men like Eldridge, who performed the supreme sacrifice, are uppermost in our thoughts and will be remembered. And Eldridge was remembered when the oldest and the youngest pupil in the assembly at his former school laid a wreath alongside friends of the Federation of Birmingham Ex-Servicemen's Association. A tree blanket bearing Eldridge's name was added to the school's peace garden, which had been created earlier in the year in the grounds of the school on Beaufort Road in Ladywood. The leader of the council is pleased that the hall has reopened. Well, yes, the, uh, all, all the memory, of course, has been behind the hoardings since last March uh, in order for the square to be refurbished. Uh, with the hoardings coming down and access now to the hall of memory again, it's been really pleasing to see uh, the little ceremony that took place this morning and uh, the books of remembrance going back into the hall of memory so that people can go back in there and remember those who gave their lives for our freedom. So I do think it's really important, the act of remembrance, and uh, of course this November 11th we'll be having a um, um, service in, of remembrance uh, over in Colmore Row because the square is not completed uh, but that will mark the 100th anniversary of course of the end of the First World War. Here's Paul Ellis who's one of the curators from the city here so just tell us a little bit about what people can see when they, when they come here. Yes certainly, um, the books are uh, readily available to, to view um, between 10 and 4, Monday to Saturday, um, in the Hall of Memory itself. Um, 
we used to turn the books on a daily, uh, daily, um, which was each page. Um, unfortunately, we don't do that anymore. So, I suppose so. it's because of the internet, isn't it? Uh, exactly, yeah. Um, so if people do want to see a particular name in either one of the books, they can actually go on to the website, which is www.ballofmemory.co.uk. But if somebody particularly wants you to see a name like I've just done today, mm -hmm. can people come in and can you do that for them? Yes, certainly. Um, just make contact with myself. Uh, my number's actually on the, on the front door. Um, and then I'll just make an appointment and then we can actually pop over, turn the page, and then they can come in readily available to see the actual name. That's an astonishingly popular building, of course, isn't it? We must get visitors from all overseas. Yes, we do. Uh, I was talking to my colleague, because um, today was the first day it's been open for just over a year as such, and we were quickly scanning through the actual uh, visitors book. And we had people from, um, from Spain, from Canada, worldwide tourists, um, Japan, um, as well as local people as well who tend to sort of pass the building and, and they've never actually been into it, inside mm. it and they've actually taken the opportunity just to pop in to see what it's, what's actually in this, inside the Hall of Memory. That's it, so you've got a great opportunity to come and have a look as well. Paul's not here all the time but there always is one of his colleagues or somebody here to help out. So that's it for this edition of Doorstep History. Very much hope you've enjoyed watching the programme and join us again next time. Goodbye and thanks for watching.